On today's Hot Zone podcast, I'm going to be talking about my trip that I'm on here to the Darien jungle in Panama, the furthest point south you can drive from North America. That's coming up on today's Hot Zone. This is the Hot Zone. Engaging with the news in a whole new way, international war correspondent Chuck Holton brings insight into areas of crisis and lets you help those affected. Hey folks, thanks for being with us. Uh, I hope you got a chance to go back and watch the 100th episode on Friday. It was pretty stinking awesome. Right now I'm in the Darien jungle in Panama. I'm at a kind of, it's one of the only hotels uh, that is, I guess this is going south from Panama City, Panama. And uh, especially once you get down in this area, I'm in a town called Meteti which is maybe 30 miles or so from the end of the road, maybe a little more, 40, 45 miles from the end of the road, uh, at Yavisa. Now, Yavisa is the furthest point south that you can drive from anywhere in North America without getting wet. And so that's not why we're here. The reason I'm here is to report on the migrant crisis. There's a kind of little known problem here in Panama hundreds of migrants from around the world, not just in Latin America, who are walking through the jungle from Colombia into Panama on their way to the United States. It's a real big problem and it's gotten much bigger since the last time I was here in 2016. And the problem is, well, simply that Panama can't handle so many people. There's a big backup of people here in the Darien jungle Uh, And I'll just tell you a little bit about what we did today, and I'll get to what we found a little later. Um, Yesterday, I went to Panama City and sat down with a couple of the subcommissioners of an organization called Centerfront. Now, Centerfront is the national border police, or the border patrol, so, so to speak, for Panama. They're also one of the most elite units in the Panamanian police slash military. I say it that way because Panama doesn't have a military force. They don't have an army or anything like that. They do have a Navy, but uh, all of that is under the police force. So the police chief in Panama is like the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff in the United States. He's in charge of everything. So they have like their version of the FBI, their version of the CIA, their version of the Border Patrol, their version of the Navy, They don't have an army so much. They got uh, police, SWAT, and things like that, investigators. Uh, And all of those are uh, all part of the Panamanian police force. It's one of the, I would say, least corrupt police forces in Latin America. We feel very comfortable with the cops here in Panama. I very, very rarely uh, have any kind of interaction with them that's negative. Even if you get pulled over for speeding or whatever, they're very polite. They, it, it's, it's uncommon to get asked for a bribe or anything like that. Sometimes people will offer them, uh, and sometimes cops will accept them. But it's, I, in my experience, very, very rare for a cop to actually expect a bribe or ask for a bribe. Now, um, they don't get paid a lot of money, but they're, they're a very professional force, I would say. They're not super well trained. If, if you were to take the training level of the average Panamanian policeman, it would probably be about on the order of your average mall cop in the United States. And that's not to disparage the Panamanian police at all. They have a very low budget. Uh, they don't spend near as much money on their police force uh, as a percentage of their you know, per capita GDP as we do. And that's partially because it's a fairly safe and, um, you know, stable country. It's partially because the government is small and limited, which is kind of what we would like in the United States. And it's a fairly pacifistic culture. Uh, So they don't have a real warrior class. They don't have, it's not a very violent culture like Honduras or Guatemala, maybe, or El Salvador. Uh, There are gangs, but not anything like the gangs that you see in those countries. So the Panamanian border police are really kind of the elite because they're the ones who are actually on the front line, so to speak, fighting against FARC, 
uh, what the remnants of those guys, the rem remnants of the Colombian rebel groups like ELN, and a lot of narco traffickers that are coming through the jungle out there. But they have a new job that has been very much like in the United States, has taken almost all of their time and attention and money, and that is watching or out for all these migrants that are coming through, walking from Colombia. Now, you've probably heard me tell this story before, but what happens is these, these are the world's poorest people who have decided it's time to go to the United States. Many of them come from Africa, the Middle East, Bangladesh, places like that, India, Nepal, Pakistan. About probably 40% of them come from Cuba. They come through this way. I mean, if you think about it, they come from Cuba and Haiti and stuff like that. Why would they go south to Colombia and then work their way back up north, walking through the, some of the worst terrain on the planet? Why not just get on a boat and head to Florida? Well, because their chances are much better coming this way. If they get on a boat and head to Florida, they are very likely to get caught by the Coast Guard and returned to their home countries. One of the things Cubans are able to do is they're able to vacation in Ecuador. That's one of the few places they're actually allowed to go. So what they do is they surreptitiously sell everything they have, including their house, for very little money. They take what money they have, they buy a plane ticket to Ecuador, and from Ecuador they start taking buses up into Colombia, across Colombia, and to a place called Turbo in the northern part of Colombia, right near the border with Panama. Along the way, they usually get robbed multiple times. Uh, one of the things that I've been told by these people is that Colombia, even their police and military, have sort of institutionalized the uh, robbery of migrants. Now, I have to say that when I was, all the time I've spent in Cucuta with the Venezuelans, I have not heard or seen much about police corruption. But apparently it's a little different when they're coming in from Ecuador and uh, Brazil and places like that. I've been told that they take them off the buses, line them up, tell them to get naked, search every nook and cranny. If a woman is kind of cute, they'll pull her off to the side and have their way with her. Stuff like that. So obviously not cool. Um, I, that's not, I can't prove that, but I've heard it over and over and over again for years from lots and lots of these migrants. So I'm assuming it's probably true. But when they get to the border of Colombia uh, uh, and the Darien Gap, they call it the tapón. And I think that's a better term because it means the plug. Uh, it's, it's less of a gap and more of a plug, you know. Um, it is about 60 miles of some of the most inhospitable jungle you could ever imagine. There's no roads through there. There are rebel groups, uh, hostile groups of Indians, uh, I say Indians, indigenous groups. Um, there are, of course, lots of animals, bugs, diseases, and things like that, and extremely harsh climate and topography to deal with. The smugglers will tell them, hey, you know, it's a day and a half walk, no big deal, here's a bottle of water, go for it. And they take off follow the, following the trail. Uh, many of them die along the way because it's, I'm told, between six and eight days walking, especially in the dry season, which we're just coming to the end of now. Uh, it is sometimes hard to find water, excruciatingly hot, very steep, uh, sleeping in the dirt or mud, and they're crossing a swamp the size of Delaware with snakes and alligators and you name it. I mean, it is some of the harshest environment on earth. So... By the time they get six or eight days through that, with no food, very little water, drinking brackish, you know, contaminated water out of the streams out there, when they get into Panama and get, you know, they, they find themselves at a Panamanian Santa Front checkpoint, what they find is that these guys are half dead or, or worse. They're telling me that they're passing bodies as they're walking through the jungle. There are bodies, people dying out there every day. And as a matter of fact, in the last year, they've had 39 children come out of the jungle without both of their parents. 
And many of those kids went into the jungle with their parents. The parents died of exposure or whatever uh, on the journey, and the kid was left to their on their own. One kid we're going to try to interview later, uh, it, I don't know, so at some point, is a little boy that they found who was so young that when they found him, he didn't know his name. He didn't know what country he was from. They figured he's from, from somewhere in Africa. He, they found him next to the body of his mother in the jungle. And it's been like a year and a half, two years since then. And now they've given him a name, Juan. He's living in an orphanage here in Panama City. They literally don't know anything about him. He had no paperwork, no nothing. He's a completely unknown entity person. Can you imagine growing up like that? It's kind of like that movie Lion, if you've ever watched that. And it sounds like a really interesting story. So I'm going to try to get a hold of that kid and, and the social workers that are dealing with him and see if they'll let us tell his story. But there's a lot of stories like that. So we went and met with the subcommissioners of Centerfront to try to get permission to come out here to the dairy end and do our thing. Do some reporting, help some people with funds that you all have contributed, and uh, see what we can do. They were at first sort of reticent to give us permission to come out because they said that they brought a BBC team out here and showed them around for a whole week. And then the BBC team went back and wrote a very negative article about them. Uh, I don't know, torturing people or something like that. <clears throat> what I think a lot of journalists don't understand, especially because th when they come here and they don't speak Spanish, is it seems kind of cruel. These people come out of the jungle and they get put into these camps, like internment camps, around in the Darien here. And they're usually co-located with villages that are uh, of the indigenous tribes, the Wonan and the Embera. They get kept there and then sometimes for weeks or even months. And it, it just seems very unfair to these people. They get very upset and angry and, and really, you know, whine and cry about getting stuck out here. Well, here's why and uh, what we found out today uh, kind of explains this. Panama is only allowed by Costa Rica to send so many people so often into their northern neighbor, Costa Rica. Costa Rica will call them and say, okay, you can send this many Cubans. Okay, you can send this many Africans. You can send this many Middle Easterners, whatever. And so if they say you can send 50 Cubans, they go get 50 Cubans from the northern border. There's a camp up there, the northern border of Panama with Costa Rica, and take those 50 Cubans and send them into Costa Rica. And then they have 50 beds open. So then they send a word down here and say, send us 50 Cubans. They replace those 50 Cubans from here. In the meantime, they might have had 350 Cubans show up down here. So they keep getting more and more and more uh, you know, Cubans, uh, well, refugees, migrants, whatever you want to call them, in, illegally crossing into their country and stacking up on the border, and they just cannot get rid of them fast enough. Well, in the United States, we have that problem, too. And what the U.S. Border Patrol has done is said, well, I guess we're just going to have to let these people go. And so they just release them because... It's a humanitarian thing to do. But you kind of have to ask yourself, is it really the humanitarian thing to do if you're doing something that's going to encourage more people to go on a journey that could very well result in their death, that is incredibly arduous, where they're going to have to leave their families behind in their home country, probably for years, almost as certainly for years, and many of them are bringing one or more children with them because they think it'll give them preferential treatment to get, get through. And so they're putting children through this incredible hardship. Anything we do to encourage these people, to facilitate them moving north, is going to just cause more pain and hardship and suffering, not just for these migrants, but for the American taxpayers who are having to foot the bill. So that's something important to think about when we are forming our policy on the southern border. And sometimes we let our heart rule over our head. And I've always been taught that that's always a bad idea, that your head should rule your heart. You need to have a heart. 
It's important to have a heart, but you also need to have a brain. And if you don't have a brain, if you don't let your brain do the thinking, if you let your heart do the thinking, or any other part of your body do the thinking, you're probably going to end up in a bad place. That's what I was taught by my dad. I would imagine your parents taught you the same thing. So we're going to talk about this more on the podcast in the coming days. We didn't really get a whole lot done today. We got a few things done, but I don't. I want to save those as we go along over the next couple of days. And um, so I hope you'll stick around and stay tuned because there's a lot more coming. We've got some amazing, amazing footage to show you uh, over the next couple of podcasts. So stick around. I'm Chuck Holton. And you're watching the Hot Zone. The Hot Zone is produced by Amy Holton and Live Fire Media. Copyright 2019.